So we will start with Pablo Valbuena. Um, also very pleased that Philip Beasley is here. Um, we created this exhibition in close collaboration with the Technical University Delft. We have uh, an artist in residence program where we have artists collaborating with uh, scientists. Uh, and many of the works that are presented here are an outcome or an output of this, um, of this residency. Um, so also Suyata, who just uh, finished her um, research at TU Delft, will be on stage with us. And uh, from uh, Russia, from St. Petersburg, uh, Daria Shkeleva uh, will present the work that we see here behind us. Uh, Pablo, can I ask you to kick it off today? Warm applause for Pablo Valbuena. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks for being here. Um, so the idea today is, uh, it's going to be a short talk, so don't get too, too nervous about it. So it's, it's going to be uh, 20 minutes. And uh, I thought that rather than bombarding you with thousands of photos of different projects, I'm just going to, to talk about one and uh, hopefully trying to sort of portray... Can we lower down the, the lights, please? So hopefully trying to, to show or trying to communicate more about the way I, 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 I work or the process of working or the ideas behind the work rather than, than just the, the outcome. No? And, um, and one of the or probably the most single sort of... Uh, idea or element that I have, have has influenced the development of my work is, is probably the idea of, of site specificity. Now, I, wa I wanted to, to start with a project with a little just introduction of, of a different, of a very early piece that it's, um, is this, this is a model of the actual piece that was done in, this was done in 2006 and it was, I started thinking about how to uh, work with time and sculpture or time in sculpture, and I started to, to think about how I could integrate video or cinema into a, a physical sculpture. I started working with this idea of uh, projecting into the sculpture itself, so uh, making a physical sculpture and then making certain transformations in, C in 3D software. And the, the, the key point was how to bring that back to, to reality. No? And uh, well, this, this ended up being uh, uh, an installation piece that um, toured in, a, in a different places. I'm not going to go too much into it, but uh, what I wanted to what I wanted to say about this piece is that the, there was a shift at some point, and I started thinking, what happens? I had th there was quite an intensive process of of building the sculpture. Uh, it was quite intricate, so it, it took a while to, a lot of effort to build that sculpture. And at some point I started thinking, what happens is, I, is I, if I remove actually the sculpture and I start working with the corner that it's actually behind the sculpture. No? And this is a little, this is one of the first tests that I did also in 2007, 2008. Uh, it, just a, a dirty corner of my, of my then studio. And uh, and suddenly it, it became quite uh, obvious that uh, there was a potential there of, of trying to speak not only about sculptural issues, but also about a space in a more wide uh, range. No? So this is just to, to sort of introduce a bit this, this step of, of thinking about objects and thinking about context. No? And, and for me, I think this has been really important to start thinking more about, about what the project means, not just in terms of an idea that I have, but an idea that I have applied to a certain context. No? And, and what I discovered is that this, this making the context or the site uh, the priority, it, it's very interesting in the sense that forces you to, to actually produce every time uh, a different work. So, having said that, I'm going to really, I mean, yeah, I'm going to jump directly into into this this project. I usually have 
one project each year or maybe two projects each year that for me are really key in the sense that they inform my practice or they, they push me forward to, to, to do really new things that I haven't done before. And this is probably the project in, in 2007 that, that um, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, I, I was, somehow there's always a project that stays in your mind or that as a, as a, as a something that uh, uh, encompasses or, or uh, all the, the, the ideas in a, in a very nice way, very organic way. And uh, this is a project that was done it was an invitation for, to do something at the Darun Cathedral for a festival. It's a festival that was a light festival. I had some, well, you know, it, it was a bit, the, the, I have some trouble with light festivals in the sense that they usually opt more for uh, a more entertainment based approach. So that's, that's something that I, I try to be careful with. But the possibility of working in a place like this, with such a, this is Darwin Cathedral, is one of the, it's UNESCO uh, World Heritage Protected, and it's, it's, it's a really a beautiful building. Uh, it's one of the first, uh, it's probably the, the best example in the UK of, of early Gothic, uh, I don't know exactly how, how the Romanico, uh, late Romanico, early Gothic, and you, you can see the, the, the big, uh, glass panels, you can see the, the arches, but there's a solidity to it. There's a really a, a, a certain uh, mass to it that it's, it's quite impressive. The proportions are beautiful. And they have usually in this festival, they use this as the main piece of the festival. And they projected like this kind of historical uh, mapping, a narrative way of, of uh, quite accessible for a general public. But I really wanted to do something in this case, that was specific to the to this amazing place that is actually still being used to as a as a religious temple. They were open to this type of project, and the amount of source, sort of history and culture that this place uh, has embedded in it is 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 something that I think it's it's nearly a matter uh, or, or a, a material to work with. No? So what I did at that time, and, and still I have been developing a lot of work that is focused also in trying to use sound as light and light as sound. So thinking about sound as, as, a, as a way to depict a space. And very quickly in this project, my interests were focusing around the bells. No? They have in this, in this uh, cathedral, they have a ring of ten bells, and uh, well, bells are one of the most functional from the Middle Ages. Uh, probably one of the first mass public communication system. It's the instrument, the musical instrument, the loudest musical instrument in the world, the the, the bell. And uh, you know, walking around the the bell ringers. So where, where they ring the bells in the cathedral, I, it came to my attention this little, this, not little, but the, the, there was this piece of paper that was hung in there. There was nobody there, so I, I didn't really have anyone to ask what, what's that, no? but it really sort of focused my attention. It, 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 sort of, it was a bit out of context. No? It's not what I was expecting to be there. And I started asking and researching a bit what was that. And it happens to be a system of notation that bell ringers use in the UK. It's a specific just to bell ringing. And uh, it was developed around the late 17th century. And it's just sequences. Each number is related to one of the bells. And it's a, it's a way of ringing the bells that was developed. It's, it's only present in the UK. And it's related to a... To a just a minor technical question, which is, uh, in, as they say, in the continent, uh, the, the rope, the, the structure, the wooden structure that goes around the bell, that supports the bell, and that is linked to the rope. In, in, in continental Europe, you would have a quarter of the structure, so it would be a quarter of a circle, or at most, 
half of a circle, and that only allows the belt to be swing to be swung to a certain angle. So basically, the way you listen to bells in in France or in Germany or it's chaotic. No, they, you don't really have a control of the sound. You just you just hear sort of a random noise. No, but in the UK, they uh, just this development of the of the full uh, circle allowed a tiny minor or what seems to be a tiny minor technical advancement, but that actually was uh, quite important for for this notation system that I'm. I'm talking about. And it's just the, the matter that you can swing the bell 360 degrees and take it to its point of equilibrium. So you, the, the bell is, starts facing down and you can take it to a point where you can stop the bell for a few seconds with the, with the force of a, human, of, a human, of a person holding the rope. It's basically that point. So that single sort of element, it's what allowed them to control the temporality of the sequences of the bells. And this is what suddenly like, uh, started to foster a, a, a way of ringing the bells that was completely different. And that this is, this is the, the notation system developed in the 17th century. And uh, they even have terms, for instance, they, they talk about the true way of ringing the bells is that it, each sequence doesn't, is, is always each line of, of, of ringing the bells is different from the previous one. So you have, and the amount of possibilities is obviously, like with 10 bells, is, we can say that it's infinite. So from a human scale perspective, so you, the, the challenge, um, they, they call peel, and the challenge most of the time is to be able to ring the bells as long as possible without repeating every single sequence. And what struck me really, I was really impressed that we are talking about the 17th century. It, it seems I was really interested in how this way of thinking is really digital, but uh, it was happening without any computer uh, available. No? So what you see here is those blue and red lines is actually signaling not uh, or a way of showing not what is the, the or trying to memorize, trying to make memorize each uh, line, but trying to show what is the pattern of, of change. No? And this is the way they, they, they ring the bell. So what is really interesting is that this system is played uh, by the bell ringers in a way where they don't memorize each uh, specific row. They just memorize the pattern of, of changing the, 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 the rope, which of changing the, the bell, the, the order of the bells. So that means basically this is, these are algorithms that are computed by human brains, life, Meanwhile, they're ringing the bells. So there is a, also a little, a, a key element also, the temporality of holding the bell in its position. We're talking about bells that weigh tons. So the, the, the time that you can hold the bell on its equilibrium point is limited. It's, a, it's about one second or something like that. So you can just swap the position of one bell from the next one. You cannot swap, you cannot take from the first sequence, you cannot take bell one from position one to position three. You can only take it from one to two. So you swap only pairs of bells. And this is what allows the algorithm to be sort of continuous. This is why the lines are certainly, you have that, these diagonals all, always in the same angle. No? So I, I was really interested in this. Uh, sort of 17th century algorithms computed by human brains. And, and uh, the project is taking this whole system, which is really embedded culturally in, in, the, in the UK, even maybe not consciously, but everyone would identify that type of sound, that type of, of music that is 
quite similar actually to some Buddhist, uh, Buddhist music, Buddhist, uh, it's, it's a type of music that you find in every culture and that it's uh, a type of music where you can identify like every row from the, from the previous to the next, you identify that they are nearly similar, they are nearly equal, but you, there's a slight shift, no? But you can identify that they are, so it's, it's, it's a music that it's constantly evolving, but it's always evolving really uh, just, just a little bit each time. No? So basically, the project was how to make this visual, how to take these ideas that uh, were already embedded in, a, in, a, in the sonic culture uh, of the place, how to take them, how to visualize them, how to make those patterns that are already happening in sound, how to make those patterns visible. And what we did is take the, the cathedral and slice it in, in 10 parts. Uh, the exterior of the cathedral and the interior of the cathedral. So you would have 10 slices. Each slice would correspond to one of the bells. And basically, the, the project is my, the, the, the project in the end happened to be my, my first performance. It was a performance that lasted for four nights during six, seven hours each night. We had 60 bell ringers uh, performing live during those four nights. And uh, it was a beautiful project. And it was a project that served me a lot to, to think about new ideas. And um, yeah, and in the end, it was, a, it was really nice to see that it's a project also that sort of transformed the cathedral into, a, into a, an instrument. It was not only the bells being played, but it was the cathedral being played. And what we, was really interesting that the, the way of visualizing and specializing these patterns into the visual realm allowed the, the bell ringers themselves to develop. What we, what we saw is that after the second day, they started playing things because they, they were seeing how these patterns were being visualized in the cathedral. They started to play patterns that they, were, that they haven't been played before. So, it was really beautiful to see how the visualization, how the transmodal perception of adding the visual content to uh, the visual patterns being visualized, not only heard, allowed them to understand what they were doing better and actually uh, change those patterns and do things that otherwise wouldn't have happened. No? Can we lower down the light, please? Um, and then as we ring it, see it drops slightly, but then it goes all the way up here. So you end up just holding on to the very end of the rope, and then it's all the way up there. Okay. And then you pull that, and it will come back down to where you started. <coughs> so there are two sort of separate parts to it, basically. Um, so of course we can control the speed of it, or speed of when it rings, because we can leave it upside down resting or yeah. just sort of balanced oh, at the top yeah. um, for a moment. What we can't do is change the speed at which it swings.
the comments section. So hopefully this, this project sort of encapsulates this idea of being even surprised by the outcome of, of, of a project. Like this project wouldn't have happened probably if, if I would have imposed a certain idea to a place. And thinking the other way around, uh, it, it probably came a project that wouldn't have happened otherwise. No? So uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if questions will be, if there's someone who can want to make any questions or we move that afterwards. Well, if there are any questions. Then we go to questions. Shy, shy audience. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Okay, um, before we go to the next artist, I would like to invite Teun Fekerk on stage. Teun is leading the Artist in Residence program with the TU Delft. He works also for the Science Center in, uh, in Delft. Uh, and actually a, a very strong partner in this exhibition, like I said before. Uh, I would almost say that you are a co-curator. Uh, I leave you to the next artist because they have been in the residency that we have together. It's yours. So, uh, like Olaf mentioned, uh, we are very, uh, very honored, very proud to be part of this exhibition with so many works uh, of uh, our Crossing Parallels program. It's the art and technology program uh, 
hosted by the Delft University of Technology, uh, about uh, uh, 10 kilometers south of, uh, of this place. Um, and uh, in this exhibition, we, we present four projects of uh, uh, residents uh, uh, and uh, artists that have been in a matching program, including Evelina Domnic and Dimitri Gelfand, who will be speaking here uh, um, right now after me, but also the, the uh, project with Philip Beasley uh, and Henriette Beer of the Faculty of Architecture and uh, Adjian van der Helm of uh, Industrial Design. Uh, later on, we have Suyata Mayumdar, uh, who is showing a work uh, upstairs uh, that she has been developing over the last years with uh, Professor Stephen Picken of Polymer Science, uh, sorry, uh, Polymer Materials. Um, uh, and we, in, the, in the back, we have the work of uh, Gaby Jonathan in the small space that she has been developing at the, at the TU Delft. Uh, later on, I would be really excited uh, to talk to you in person, maybe at the pro meeting tonight, uh, what's the value of these uh, uh, collaborations between artists and scientists. Um, in the past century, we have been in the Netherlands. My time. <laughs> I think that was my time. I have to insert another coin in here. Um, yeah. So um, let's talk about that later. Um, uh, what's really important that, that from this day on, and not, and not just uh, 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 me, uh, the TU Delft, uh, Olaf uh, connecting us with, with great artists, but all of you uh, should be investigating new opportunities to, uh, uh, to collabor collaborate across borders. Let's, let's break down these, these borders of the sciences and technology and, uh, and of artists, and let's find new ways uh, 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 to collaborate and inspire each other. So with that note, I would like to, to uh, invite uh, Evelina Domnic and, and Dimitri Gelfand on stage, who will be speaking uh, about their work. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming, and um, we are extremely grateful to today's art festival for supporting our work and uh, creating such an amazing event uh, here in the city of The Hague. As our slide presentation will hopefully gradually surface, uh, since there's been so much talk at this festival uh, about going down uh, rabbit holes, and uh, we have two uh, black hole modeling artworks in the exhibition, we figured that it would be appropriate to talk about the vortical nature of black holes, wormholes as a macroscopic manifestation of quantum entanglement, and uh, the paradoxical transition from a smooth flow into turbulence. Why Turbulence. This was a deathbed uh, question of one of quantum theory's inventors, uh, Werner Heisenberg. A question that he deemed unanswerable. Well, only a few years ago in 2017, an answer surfaced. An answer proving the uh, predictions of uh, Soviet mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov in the 1940s that turbulence is not uh, an example of a transition in, in the case of uh, laminar flow into turbulent flow from uh, order into chaos, but rather a transition of order into higher order. Turbulence manifests itself as a cascade of kinetic energy. Large vortices break up into smaller ones, which then break up into ever smaller ones. Uh, it, is, it occurs in a fractal-like fashion. And so this brings us to uh, one of the pieces in the show, Orbehedron. Perhaps you'd like to... Uh, so we, we, in uh, 2016, we are very fortunate to be invited to LIGO, which is uh, one of the most gigantic scale scientific projects uh, today. 
uh, it's a huge interferometer that uh, was built uh, was being built by thousands of people, engineers, uh, for almost 40 years before the first detection was successful, and it was supposed to measure the ripples of space time. Uh, and the, this uh, ripples in space-time, gravitational waves, they, uh, they are so difficult to detect because space-time is extremely rigid. It's so difficult to vibrate it. And only collisions of supermassive objects, such as uh, very massive black holes, can be detectable. So uh, we developed two artworks there. Uh, one called Orbihedron, presented here. And um... yeah, the, one, one of the curious things that you will notice when you see this artwork is that in, indeed uh, this uh, black shadow that is caused there is uh, the result of a singularity. Just as in the case of a black hole, there is this area where the, the light cannot pass through. And um, the ring around that, that black hole shadow is uh, akin to what is known as an ergosphere and to other uh, rather exotic phenomena such as uh, super radiance, where it was actually believed at first that light would never be able to uh, escape a black hole, but as has been proven um, quite recently by the very first image of a black hole, uh, the light, in fact, leaks out, as quantum theory predicts, and can actually even be um, rather intensified by the spinning of the black hole. So uh, black holes are fascinating because mo even, even more than physical objects, they're really epistemological, they are mental constructions of human mind. And uh, the previous talk by Pablo uh, was, um, also brings us kind of to the beginning of black holes because the first mention of black holes was by John Mitchell uh, the scientist clergyman in Great Britain who in 1784 wrote a letter to Cavendish where black holes were first hypothesized as such supermassive uh, astronomical objects, stars, that are so massive that even light cannot escape from them. So as soon as you had uh, Newton's laws of gravity it was already enough to imagine black holes, and he called them uh, frozen stars? Dark stars and frozen stars, yes, yes. There were several terms at, at that time. Another amazing connection between uh, the artistic imagination and black holes was made in 1915, and uh, it's quite a fantastic coincidence because the first formula describing black holes stationary black holes, not rotating one, which also not, not taking from observation, purely from mental construction, mathematical formulas, was by uh, Schwarzschild, who died very young, just a few months later, in the trenches of the Russian front. But this last, I don't know, he was in his tw late 20s or early 30s, and in this last three months of his life, he was writing from the front letters to Albert Einstein applying the equations of um, relativity theory to these supermassive objects and coming up with the first mathematical formula for a black hole. And this letter to Einstein is three days uh, um, apart from the opening of an exhibition in St. Petersburg called uh, Zero Ten, where the black square was first exhibited and by Kazimir Malevich. And the black square first appeared in his backdrop to the futuristic uh, opera Victory Over the Sun. So obviously these associations were made in the arts in the, and this idea of uh, a black hole was out in the air. Uh, so, this brings us to a sister artwork uh, called ER equals EPR that we developed at LIGO, which involves uh, two entangled black hole analogs. Uh, 
you can see that there is a sort of a vortical bridge connecting uh, these, uh, this, this vortical pair. And uh, it, they, they are co-rotating. So, so one is rotating in one direction, whereas the other is in a, uh, the opposite direction, just as in the case of uh, all of the black holes that have thus far, thus far been detected. They, uh, they always come in pairs, curiously. Um, so, uh, in, in, in this piece, there's a gigantic aquarium that is lit from below by uh, a, a, an, an extended uh, laser beam that actually fits the entirety of the aquarium, and the projection is, is thereby on the ceiling. This was actually uh, uh, recently uh, shown at an exhibition in, uh, in Bergamo, Italy, called Black Hole, colon, Art and Materiality from the Informal to the Invisible. And what was particularly astounding for myself and Devilina to participate in the show with the likes of uh, Anish Kapoor and um, and, and, and quite a few of, I would say, the, uh, the, the pioneers of uh, Italian art of the, uh, of the middle uh, of the 20th century, the likes of Manzoni, Fontana, Buri, Buri was that... Movimento Arte Nucleare, but for us it was especially uh, um, amazing to be part of the show because these great uh, masters of painting of the 20th century who were who most of them are dead and a lot of them tried to kill painting so Manzoni was cutting the canvas Buri was setting uh, canvas on fire and uh, they, they um, uh, m most of their art was uh, quite abstract and some of the sculptures presented there by uh, people like uh, Giacometti and uh, also Manzoni, they were, they, they looked like meteorites, also like these um, uh, objects coming from the sky. And uh, hollow and meteorites, <laughs> though, that's an important thing to note that you, you, you see something that looks like a meteorite and then you, you see that inside of it is a hole. And uh, the, the show ended with the uh, ER equals EBRA installation uh, kind of uh, uh, ending this uh, love affair with painting. <laughs> um, so the second uh, piece that we're showing, uh, which was a collaboration with the Crossing Parallels Program and the Aerospace Engineering Department at TU Delft, um, has to do with uh, microscopic uh, soap bubbles that are conventionally used to, um, to model complex airflow uh, in, in gigantic wind tunnels, primarily for uh, the sake of getting an understanding of the, the, the airflow around spacecraft as they exit and enter uh, the uh, earthly atmosphere. Uh, yeah, this, this piece actually um, also harkens back to, to, to older work. Uh, we, Evelina and I have been for, for ages fascinated by uh, soap bubbles. And uh, in, in both cases, there, there's a uh, interaction between laser light and, and soap film. Soap film, which happens to be actually the chemical ancestor of all living cells, of, of the lipid membranes that constitute the... the the protective layer of, 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 of living cells. And so they, uh, the, why bubbles? Because they, uh, they are extraordinary lenses, and they are lenses that can become as thin as a single molecule. So uh, in, in our earlier piece, which we presented at, uh, at Two Days Art uh, some years ago, a piece called 10,000 Peacock Feathers and Foaming Acid, there, um, laser light enters a rather large hemispherical uh, soap bubbles and uh, instead of going through the uh, the membrane as it would through a normal optical uh, medium 
it actually breaks up into micron thin optical tracks, each of which create a rather magnified projection of molecular dynamics happening inside of the soap film. Here, it's kind of the, the, the tables are completely turned. The soap bubbles are microscopic and they are modeling a macroscopic um, combination of flows, laminar flow as well as turbulent flow and the transitions in between. And as you can see in the middle there is, uh, is, is an, well, you actually can't see the orifice, but you can imagine that there's an orifice into which uh, these bubbles are being sucked. And the, the um, title of the work that refers to, to thoughts, to, to, to consciousness, also has to do with uh, some of the interesting conjectures about uh, information, the, the interaction of information and uh, uh, black holes. And one of the scientists who was quite inspiring to us, um, he never got a... Nobel Prize, uh, John uh, Archibald Wheeler. Uh, yes, he uh, he's, uh, he came up with the word black holes, and uh, um, yes, he uh, in the beginning of his career he was really interested with particles, and particle physics was being born at the time, and. Uh, he wanted to explain everything from the point of view of particles. Then, in the second part of his life, he moved into waves and fields. Uh, and uh, after that, he moved into the ideas about information and entropy. And these ideas that were later picked up by people like Juan Moldesena and... Uh, uh, Stephen Hawking and R Roger and, Penzo. And, and locals like Eric Ferlinde. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, they, they led to amazing uh, developments in contemporary physics that have to do with quantum computing, but quantum computing is really about the, uh, the, the furthest f forefront of fundamental science, of fundamental knowledge about physical world. And most of these questions, uh, they go around information and whether information can be destroyed in black holes and what, what happens to information as the kind of order or ordered structures as it enters the black holes. So we, we wanted to create this um, um, experience of... Um, yeah, d deleting, deleting all the thoughts into this little hole. So, we would like to end, although I, I, I certainly plan to, to show uh, a little uh, video that illustrates uh, my next few thoughts, but uh, we, we, will, we will cut it short with, with just a few images. Our first uh, ever artwork with vortices dates back to... Um, 2003. Uh, it's, it's an artwork called Camera Lucida Sano Chemical Observatory, and their uh, sound waves cause microbubbles of air in, in uh, water to implode, to collapse, at which point they emit light, and this light takes the shape of the sound waves, allowing us to observe sound three-dimensionally in total darkness. Uh, at first, when we did uh, all kinds of experiments uh, with, with sonoluminescence, the only thing that we were able I think my, my ah, there we go, uh, rather orderly, uh, more or less parallel wave fronts would appear. But then, when we cranked up the amplitude, we saw that sound can behave like a spiral, like a vortex, like a ring, like an orbital structure. Um, and what, what happens is that uh, these areas of high and low pressure that sound kind of uh, makes a grid in space of these areas and high and low pressure, and if you crank the amplitude, it creates a vortex in every single cell of space. And um, 
actually, I don't like to give talks. I think that words are very misleading. And if we want to understand the world around us, it is not with words that we will make the biggest progress. And uh, I, I studied philosophy, and I always wondered at this statement of Plato that all the knowledge we get from the past, our soul remembering uh, things from its past lives. And in a way, uh, this uh, understanding the, the, the language of nature and how everything in nature can be in such uh, harmony and feedback and talking to each other without having a common language for us, looking at vortices, looking at this very tiny energy transfers is like our soul remembering all the knowledge that we already have in us. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Um, actually, when you try to bring the very complex theories from science and explain it to, to the audience, it's always kind of challenged how to simplify, but not too much, but still be clear for the like, audience without like, high education in like, quantum physics. What is your actual method to simplify, but understand that it's not simple enough, so you're not losing the point? So, the, yeah, so the, if you want, the simple, uh, the direct rabbit hole, you should go and look at our artworks, because for that you don't need any knowledge. You're, you're, you, you will understand it. When we give talks, indeed, they are much more dry and scientifically oriented. So during our talks, we, we try not to simplify, but to bring this amazing background from science and this amazing work that is done by uh, unbelievable minds of our civilization and for us the the um, the content of our work what really interests us the the art uh, the the subject is uh, what the human mind is you know that what what scientists are doing with their minds wrapping it around the universe and black holes and this is for us where to look to make interesting art. So in our talks, we try to, to go into that, which of course, without hard work, you will not be able to penetrate these realms. So, but if you don't want to get too burdened by that, uh, just look at the artworks, but there is no easy way into, into contemporary science. People also have this preconception that science is complicated and difficult. I think that science really tries to elucidate the world. And if you will have a little bit of patience and follow it, it will actually make things clearer and will show you some amazing connections and simpler. Thank you so much. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. The two works are in the back. And, uh, next one, Philip Beasley from Toronto, uh, architect, designer, uh, collaborated with also Iris van Herpen, Dutch fashion designer with beautiful collections, um, and recently also in the residency program of the TU Delft, uh, collaborated with students, uh, which resulted in a beautiful piece that you will see in the back of the factory. I'll help you setting up. Thank you. Stage is yours. This is working okay? Hello, colleagues. Um, Tan and, and colleagues from TU Delft and from TEDU, T Today's Art, thank you so much. It's, a, it's an extraordinary honor to, to be with us. And 
the question that, that Dimitri, you just raised of turbulence folding into new order and meaning rather than enacting the kind of terrifying interpretation of, of entropy as being decay where we turn into dust is one that I find such a tearing and, and curious and, and fascinating hope. And I, I, would, I would love to explore this question of whether some optimism is possible about whether human habitation in the world could generate living structures, could generate fertility, rather than be ultimately only a kind of holding away the inevitable of cessation, of disorder. I'm going to try to give a rather optimistic talk that perhaps is an emotional counterpoint to some of the things that you've, you've just said. In previous work, I've done quite immersive, perhaps even symphonic work. And it has generated a sense of trembling and precarity and searching for ways to resonate and to feel and to contribute new qualities to the way we live a kind of an expanded physiology. It comes from a fundamental tradition. I'm an architect and a sculptor. And the solid world that I was taught about is one that perhaps we all share, the sense that the planet, perhaps underneath our feet, is still absolutely eternal. In that kind of sensibility, it becomes possible to have perhaps a pride and an optimism of using all our might to make a place. Is that okay? And yet, what of the world today? How is it possible to have such optimism when the future is unspeakably uncertain? When the life that we have taken for granted is no longer something that we can hold. How is it possible to speak about shaping the environment and working and projecting? Perhaps some layers can be projected that start to capture truly living qualities and fertility. Perhaps with synthetic craft, it's possible to start to build earth and to build sensitivity and to build renewal in rather hesitant multiple octaves of contributions. I'll try to justify this with some specific craft that I'll offer. And the uncertainty of this I want to capture by just sharing a sense of perception first. When I stood in front of these woods, first I was rather proud of myself because I could see the animal tracks and I'm used to being in the woods, and I know how to see those tracks, and I can find my way. And I project this path, and I look deeper and deeper, and I can see this scene reaching out from me, where I can see that little being that's gone into that way, and I can know that that actually is a, is a whole path of animals that go into the woods that way. And then another on the other side, and one further and further, and then I look even further and I see the bent twigs and I can somehow know that this has been a whole way that things are moving and shaping. And I look even further and I look at just the tiniest glimmers of the hints that say that here is a track and here is another track moving and moving. And then I think I look even further and I can somehow project that this myriad of veins are moving all the way through this environment. And I feel and see those things moving. And I wonder, when am I stopping actually seeing the evidence? And when am I somehow projecting and printing into that scene? If 
in sensitively being in this extraordinarily immersed space, I am simply responding to evidence that I'm doing a kind of a duty. And yet it seems that in our neural structures and in our projections, I kind of want to share this with you. There, we'll do that. Well, what I was just trying to share was a sense that in addition to seeing the subtlest evidence, that it seems that I am also printing into this scene and that I am almost a marionette of my own ingrained rigging of being disposed to see and exchanging and printing and moving back and forth in a kind of an extraordinary movement of preconception as well as seeing, the kind of inconstancy and uncertainty of what we are doing as being a response or a projection is one of the things that I want to capture by offering some new veils, some new works. This body of work that I've just tried to capture with a sense of uncertainty and contribution starts with quite resolute craft, spinning landscapes, floating, reinforcing the earth. More recently, through digital fabrication and several layers of additional craft, the worlds have become quite immersive, shot through with computation as well, making kinetic systems that move and breathe with us. Some of these have colonies of material in them, made very, very thin and rippling and going like pebbles in ponds all the way through environments, trying to craft a sense of the world listening to us, breathing with us. Kind of a, a lovely sense of being received and being heard and being empathized with and playing. I've started to work with some shells of material as well that roll back and make great sanctuaries. And some of this work really does achieve a kind of a saturation in which I and me and you and us are able to feel like we're continuous with the environment. This is an image with my beloved friend, Iris Van Herpen and collaborator Petra here, here, here in the audience. Where, where we wove this work together directly with some couture and, and, a, and a surrounding space in Toronto last year. And that series, I'm just gonna skip through a few examples of this kind of deeply saturated, porous network, is one now that is starting to become quite deliberate and quite strong as it's taking on more and more architectural forces and starting to equip itself with the ability to make architecture again a kind of rather hesitant architecture, but one which I think can be resilient enough to be sensitive and make a contribution. Here we can see some of the examples in which great veils billow out as well as very, very strong nests making sanctuaries. And within the fabrics, there are deeply saturated networks and manifolds of individual liquids which are interconnected together, the chemistry of which makes protocells, prototype cells, which start to make chemical self-renewing systems as well, bedded in oil and making vesicles and having little precipitations that suggest a way of creating skins that could renew themselves in the surrounding environment. Alongside that chemical system, there's a mesh work, mesh work of microprocessors that send out vibrations and light and very, very gentle responses that stimulate the growth and stimulate the empathetic responses. And that's founded on a sense of a fundamental kind of material quality, which instead of trying to push or cut or make solid, tries to find the most precarious point of all in which something might tip this way and might tap that way, but is somehow so primed that it is full of pluripotency. That is to say, 
that it may respond in a myriad of ways, trying to find a quality of reactivity and potency. And spinning that together then creates a sense of, I hope, embodiment and touch, a kind of deep participation in the world, which is not simply a matter of commanding, but rather encountering, making these kind of veils and making these fabrics that might be capable of being sensitive. Just as a digression to try to capture something of the quality of the fabrics, I'm just going to look at a couple of paintings, and I hope it's okay with you if I become, look at some rather emotional work. One particular painting, Matthias Grunewald, in the extraordinary series in the Isenheim Altarpiece, works with the fabrics that I've just been speak, speaking about and turns them into an extraordinary rictus, folding into itself the almost unspeakable iconography of the event that you can see here. And in another panel of this same painting, we can see a whole spectrum of extraordinary kind of responses to the world. I love at the top of the scene, the kind of meticulous observation of light as an individual anatomy dissolves out into the ether in the most kind of precise observation of a series of energy states expressed in spectrum. I love the sense that that in turn could turn into stigmata, which could turn into stars, this beautiful kind of resonance of multiple imagery. And then when I look beyond that energy exchange and light, I start to look at the fabric itself, the veil that's wrapping all around this extraordinary divine figure from Christendom. And I look at how from the radiant golden hair it wraps around and then her turns blushing rose and then wraps and writhes again into, into blue and dives into the earth as if a kind of transposition from pure, pure light into blushing, blushing blood and then into venous anoxic blood and then draining into the soil. As I move downward, I look at this almost unspeakably fertile middle ground where the textiles turn into vulva and then fold again and become an umbilical cord as it rolls down and then turns into this kind of mineral insect-like grotesque existence. I love the kind of essay of a whole spectrum of materiality that becomes possible and somehow it tells me that textile can have this extraordinary range that can give and dissolve and also pull and be deeply empathetic and engender and refresh as well, this whole extraordinary range. It encourages me, I think, that it becomes possible to think about an anatomy as having second skins and sensitive extensions and perhaps that they can touch and work with the subtlest of, ph of phenomena as well, and perhaps turn into a felt world, perhaps making materials which can resonate and gather in those kinds of sensations that I'm trying to express and resonate back and make inner cores. So let me just offer some built projects that try to work with the kind of motivations that I've been sharing with you. Just three projects that I'll skip through. In the first, building the ground, there was a storm-scoured coast on, in, in Maine, and a farmer's field was cleared from alder scrap, scrap material and made into this geodesic framework into a geotextile, which was used for reinforcing earth, and then laid out and allowed to grow for about five years, in which, in which little animals drove their way through it and made nests and turf slowly accumulated and ma made a, a second reinforced land over top of the first. In a second project, that kind of sensibility of making a scaffold and then clothing it was made rather more deliberate by, by, by building up as a scaffold and then clothing it. The geometry of this 
started to question whether crystalline networks were adequate. The idea that crystals always have cracking planes and are always somehow an excess of order, a kind of an imposition. So a Penrose tessellation, Roger Penrose, the great physicist, inv invented this tile work uh, based, based on the 10-way division of a circle, which could combine and then never ultimately repeat, even though there are local symmetries. A kind of a beautiful tessellation, a wonderful way to make a, an interlinked, resilient network. And using that system then, small components were, were designed to link together. And then on top of those, individual tile works were, were conceived in, fa in families, make, making a great resilient turf in principle, and then used to colonize and, and generate quite a large fabric with, with, with varying species of material. Here's a, a sample of, of, the, of the textile itself that you can see, you can see in, in light. And it was composed of individual tiles which were quite carefully cut out of mylar using some of the precarious detailing that I was showing you er, er, earlier so that they would tremble and so that when, when they toothed together, they would make little valves and mouths that would pull air through them and make, them in, make the entire thing into, into a kind of mechanical pump. Behind, the work became a bit more emotional because each of those tiles was also held by barbed bladders that would pull organic matter through. And so the, the entire work was really set up as a kind of a feeding machine for itself of, of gathering in and trying to, to become a kind of inchoate earth surface machine. With within, within individual needers, needles and punctuations and, and, and gills that would, would collect organic matter. Making this, this kind of quilt into a rather emotional, hungry soil. In a recent project, that kind of work has been extended with intermeshed microprocessors that are being used to fold patterns of individual Im impulses all through fabrics. And here you can see some, some of this, the behind the scenes software that my colleague Paul Holloman of 4D Sound and, and a number of other collaborators are working with us. So that the sense of individual impulses moving through an environment can have a sense of agency in which multiple in, individual actors and multiple individual people can respond. You can you can see how the soft how the software is, is working within the control system and then and then how how the how the field behind is responding. And this is, is built up in, in very straightforward ways. First generations of these control systems, like, like the much much earlier system that, that you see here, is groups of, of individual mechanisms individually controlled by microprocessors and then following deterministic behavior sets. That, that, that is, if a sensor fires, then, then there is a pattern that, 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 that behavior will, will result. In more recent groups, the populations of those individual processors and the maps of what they do is mobile and it's conceived instead as a series of overlapping grid works and mesh works that can shift. And so the entire populations start to evolve and start to assign themselves in a whole variety of ways, depending on how people react to them. And this uses, I won't try to, try to explain the, 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 the software network, but this is a high level picture in which we have firmware, that, that is to say instruction sets that directly say, here's an instruction, that goes there, just like Pablo was saying, I think, think about the, about the bell, bell ringing. And then on, on the right-hand side, you can see a simulator set which is emulating that and which is plastic and which is able to continually evolve along with graphic user interfaces and visualizations where, where we can feel what is going on and work with it very tangible, tangibly. And I do want to point out one part of the, of, of the software systems that we're working with now, which is a curiosity-based learning algorithm. And you can see it just diagrammed in a very, very simple way here in, 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 the, in the center of this, of this, in which it's working very specifically with mechanisms on one hand and with sensors on the other and with proprioception particularly, which means that the machine environment can sense itself and then feed back into itself and so it can evaluate and learn. And that's based on, on, on a fundamental kind of reward structure in machine learning, in which rather than trying to optimize the very best way of doing something, or 
get something to correspond with something that's known so that then it can achieve a definite goal. Instead of that, the reward for the, for the machine work, the motivation for, for each of the actions is what you don't know, something that you don't rec recognize. That requires pretty organized memory, in fact, banks of comparative memory, and it requires a lot of cycling of, of behavior. But it produces very curiously, kind of extraordinary, kind of rich behavior of searching and trying to find and probing. And in isolation, it's tremendously disruptive soft software, but when it's combined together with, with, with other, uh, let's say, benign uh, uh, so, uh, so, software systems that do create coherence and that do create paths. It has a kind of a, a very refreshing quality that I'm very hopeful about working with more. The sense of an individual sensitive action then, together with a searching response that can play, is one that's in the, in, at, at the heart of this work. And here you can see just the start of this kind of behavior in this setup, which is, which is now, now in Berlin, as it responds to its neighbors. So let me sum up. This work starts with stable architecture and unapologetically fragile work develops within that sanctuary and tries with the kind of experience and the kind of hesitant innovation, perhaps, or discoveries to move outside and to be engaged with larger forces in the environment and start to, to, to contribute. And that, in turn, gives some kinds of confidence, however hesitant, in building the ground and creating a renewal. And it also creates enough coherence that the original solid walls can start to defect in favor of a kind of a much more resilient, sensitive scaffold around each of us instead of needing solid walls and boundaries, which makes it possible to start to participate with subtle things, with projecting multiple octaves of exchange. And perhaps that makes it possible to conceive of a future architecture, which rather than asserting, can be empathetic and drawing in. So, let me just summarize that the work is founded on touch and it's founded on a rather hesitant sense of projecting and receiving. It's founded on a sense of uncertainty and it's rather optimistic. Thank you. And it's rather optimistic. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thanks, Philip. Is there any question? Yeah, thank you for a speech. Uh, could you please tell us uh, what materials you normally use in your projects and uh, in, in the prism of ecology and environment? I'm so sorry. What materials you used to use in your projects? The, the, the the materials that are used in this project are, are a range. Um, older generations were using oil sourced pol polymers and, and, and metals. Um, and increasingly, we're using fully recyclable PETG. Um, and we're trying to move into, into biopolymers. Um, one, one, of the, one of the essays of this work is making thin things thick. And the material is rather high performance, and, and if it was looked at in, in isolation, it would be part of the problem. It would be just pu pure, purely con consumptive, co consumptive material, li like, li like what is impossible uh, in, 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 in our industry. And yet, I would say that, that the kind of strategies of making very, very thin membranes and then carefully cutting them and, and mechanically expanding them or thermally expanding them, that's uh, the, the, the environment here is, is, uses those strategies. We have just a few kilos of material able to make a whole building scale. So there's a kind of a radical efficiency, at, at least, uh, that, that I think is a contribution even if the materials uh, are, are not the, 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 the final ones that, that I, would, I would defend at all. 
it makes a, a, a kind of sensibility of, of being able to work anyway. The, the range of materials then is polymers, biopolymers, very thin, very thin metals, and then the fluids are a range of oils, so, uh, some heavier than water, some aqueous solutions, some, some lighter than water in order to set up dif differentials. So it's, it's a mixture of, of textiles and solid material. There's very, very little solid material though. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's a constant dialogue. I mean, kind of a, a hunger for substance, but trying to earn it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hands together for Philip. So uh, we are concluding this artist talks now with um, Sujata Mojamdar and uh, uh, Stephen Picken, uh, professor of polymer materials. I just uh, got that right. Uh, who will uh, share a little bit about their uh, their, their residency uh, with the project uh, A Cure for Concrete. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, a Cure for Concrete is the title of our project. I'll just give you a rundown of um, what our work is and a bit about our collaboration. Uh, this is a spontaneous presentation. We haven't been prepared, so it'll be a bit shorter and a bit more improvised than the other presentations. This is the work upstairs, if you haven't seen it. Um, there are three parts to this work. This is a live installation in the middle. When I met Stephen, I was, uh, my background's actually in photography with uh, physics I studied before that. And I was taking pictures at the time of deteriorating walls, um, patterns that come about at the interface of man-made and nature. So I went to Stephen and the idea was to be able to recreate these patterns in my studio and learn more about them in that way. Uh, when we met, I found out that Stephen has a uh, protective coating for concrete. So our um, collaboration evolved from a, a change in perspective. Um, we wanted to explore the pictorial potential of concrete and protecting concrete and extending its longevity rather than uh, taking pictures of deteriorating concrete. Um, do you want to say something about the coating? Yes, so the, the, the coating that I was uh, involved with was a sort of a, one of these by chance um, uh, occasions when you're doing research. A student came to visit me and he was working at civil engineering and wanted a coating for protecting his concrete and uh, I was discussing with him and, and, and we, he said, okay, the coating needs to last 28 days and then it is supposed to fall off again. And I thought, okay, I don't want to use a, use a synthetic polymer. I'll use something which is biodegradable, which is compatible with the environment. And so we started using this uh, seaweed and uh, nano clay based uh, coating, which is now called Delft Green. He, he phoned me one week later and said, okay, it actually works. And we wrote a patent and now there's a company making this stuff. But the weird thing about this coating is that it protects the concrete, it makes it cure better, it, more, it becomes more dense so that the concrete constructions last longer. And so actually it's to prevent decay of a material, it prevents the decay of the concrete. And Sujata, of course, was interested in all of these patterns that you get when, when uh, buildings and constructions and environments are actually um, uh, changing their appearance over time. And so we thought maybe we can use this coating to control the rate of decay or make patterns in the decay which is forming and so on. So the yeah. title, A Cure for Concrete, is twofold. Um, a Cure for Concrete, curing, is what protects concrete and makes it last much longer. And as you've probably heard from the news in the last year or two, um, our concrete is not lasting long enough to be sustainable. Uh, the Pantheon in Rome is also made of concrete, but it's 2,000 years old. So curing is something that's really essential for the future. Um, my interest in patterns and using the coating as a vehicle for uh, colors, as you can see here, 
We used um, products that come out of the wastewater treatment process. So there's basically a sort of zero waste solution. Uh, and we experimented with different coatings um, through Delft Green. And uh, some of the most interesting results uh, were actually the previous slide, which was uh, Vivianite. And that is the live installation that we have upstairs that you can see. So the Vivianite drips. And we completely coincidentally found that this actually changes color on the surface of wet concrete. And what we love about this process is that the patterns are spontaneous and difficult to control. And um, so, for instance, the spectrum that you just saw, we can't predict exactly how to make it happen. So there's pH, there's humidity, there's the kind of concrete, cement, and there's a lot of variables that go with it. Um, the significance of uh, mm. the conditions? Yes, so the, 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 the pattern that we also we can see upstairs as you can see that the, the flow pattern itself is, is sort of uh, chaotic, is unpredictable. And the color change that we see, the blue, it starts this blue color. And then as a function of time, it changes to this darker, more uh, iron oxide-like uh, color. But it doesn't do it all over the place in the same way. So it got, you get these patches, and we can't predict where they form, or what, we don't even understand quite why they form. But you get these uh, very, I, th I think, very beautiful and interesting spontaneous patterns forming. And so you have the, the flow, chaos, the pattern formation, chaos. The changing in the color is, is the effect of light and of oxygen and of pH change. So it's going more alkaline. And so it's basically a sort of a, a, a fast, um, a real-time real example of aging of a material. So this, this is what happens to your buildings, but 10,000 times faster, shall we say, which I think we, we only realize that a lot of these things we, we only understand after the fact. So we're following our nose and we go all over the place. And after some time, things start to fall into place and we figure out, okay, this is what is actually the, the significance of these things. So there's some other coatings that we also prepared. Uh, sorry, <laughs> we tried. Um, and um, we also opened up the whole process. So um, I had a temporary lab in the Science Center in TU Delft. That's where my residency took place. Uh, Stephen Pickens are based at the Applied Sciences Lab. And um, we also held a hackathon for students. So we wanted to make the process as open as possible and for people to be able to take part in it and use, have access to the same materials as us. I had an open lab so people could come along and ask questions and see what I was doing. And a lot of our collaboration was done per WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have so. at least five or six sort of WhatsApp groups all, all clashing with each other. And I mean, so we had, what was it, 15 students or so, I guess, yeah. in total. And so they all start with the same basic material and, and the same sort of general idea. And then you see 15 completely, totally different things. On the right. Hello. Yeah. As you look at it. Well, the products of my artistic research, as you look at the installation, are on the left, uh, with the live installation in the middle, and the hackathon pieces on the right. So Some microphones still working? I think so. Right. <laughs> um, anything else? Yeah, so I think, I mean, also, also uh, with the sort of from a, from a university perspective, so why do I do these things? And, and so Sujat and, uh, Sujat and I both like photography a lot, and we like these, these marvelous patterns that you see in the environment around us that, that form spontaneously. So there's the photography and light and things like that is a, is a common theme. And so the, this Vivianite coating we saw just now, which turns from blue to brown, is actually very surprising. And so I'd never, I would have never even thought of starting to study this stuff until I was uh, uh, discussing with Sujanta and we said, okay, maybe we'll try this, uh, this material. And the more you look at it, the more surprising it gets. So it's quantum mechanically actually a very weird material. It has a, a color which it shouldn't have. And so that means that there's sort of also new science is somehow emerging from this, this uh, uh, collaboration. So exploring. Show That's it.
Out of sound. Out of sound, out of time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Is there any question? Maybe later upstairs. Okay, the last artist for this artist talk session today, uh, Daria Shkeleva from St. Petersburg. Please come on stage. Um, she will give an introduction on the work that is actually behind you. So maybe slowly while you talk, we can go in that direction. Uh, it's a neural network that has been trained within, I think, even five days or something, right? No, no, it's much more. <laughs> really? No. I leave it to you. Uh, okay. Uh, Eden, no, it's, it's still training, and uh, the point is with neural networks. So every with every more time we have, so we have a new result, and that's it. So we can download it like every day. That's why it's uh, like improving all the time and learning. So um, firstly, uh, I would like to start with uh, thanks. Uh, um, I'm very grateful uh, for today's art festival for this amazing opportunity for. Uh, to participate in such a brilliant event and personally to all of you inviting me with our installation and uh, making this uh, site-specific project we made here and uh, so I, I really uh, I'm really happy to be here among the greatest artists I would say and so uh, amazing works around so and um, let's then <laughs> talk about my work, right? Uh, so the Eden installation. Uh, here I talk uh, uh, the, uh, in every and many of our religions uh, we have the idea of this marvelous uh, place without death, diseases, like a marvelous garden, uh, the Garden of Eden, yes, in some traditions in the Bible there was such an idea. And uh, in Christian tradition uh, the expulsion of Adam from uh, the Garden of Eden was one of the most terrible things that happened to humanity. So it caused the disconnection of uh, humans from nature, disconnection between each other, and uh, it's, it, it was a, a terrifying, I would say, <laughs> catastrophe if, if to talk about that. Uh, so here I compare the earth uh, with this marvelous garden, and so maybe we'll have to abandon it because our first for knowledge one day. The constant technological progress of mankind systematically influences our planet and its ecosystems, which may further lead to the fact that we will exile from Earth due to destruction and unusability for life. In Eden Project, uh, both the meaning of the abbreviation and the meaning of the word itself are important. So E is for emulated, D, digital, E, experience of nature. So here we play with uh, denoting the name of a fictitious reality simulator created in some future to imitate wildlife that has already ceased to exist. So uh, we give this experience uh, while well, comparing the Earth and Eden Garden with the... Uh, uh, our planets that one day maybe we'll have this only simulation reality made by artificial intelligence for example yes here we use a narrow, narrow networks trained on real train images and uh, like with every step you can uh, influence that uh, idea and see it uh, in this project which we present here in this part of the project we are focused on fi fire uh, forest fires they are the main uh, reasons um, of forest fires, 90% of them are caused by human activities right now. Only 7 to 8% is caused by lightning. And the fires which are caused uh, naturally, they, uh, uh, they are not so uh, terrifically uh, huge. And uh, for example, if a lightning goes on the top of the, of the tree, right, uh, till it goes down, uh, the location will be not so big as, for example, if a human starts uh, the fire. So it goes from down and it spreads very quickly. So the hundreds of kilometers of forest die. So that's a very big difference. The natural renewal of nature caused by lightning and the human activities which make a disaster and destroy 90% of lungs of our planet. Uh, so here we focus on this idea and also, you know, maybe that right now in Siberia we had a big uh, catastrophe uh, with forest fires and also in Brazil, everywhere in the world we have this problem and we'd like to pay attention to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, this is the end of the artist talk sessions. Uh, next here on stage 
is a, a panel with captain of the Sea Shepherd, no, Sea Watch and Sea Shepherd, actually, uh, Pia Klemp and philosopher uh, Sretko Horvat uh, about uh, the borders of Europe. Thank you very much.